Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm very excited today to have, um, I guess it's today still evening in your in yes. central time. <laughs> Dr. Rabia Kesser here. She's going to talk a little bit about the surgical management of Chiari, um, really talking more about kind of like how the surgeon makes these decisions about what to do in surgery, um, which is a topic we've never had before. So I'm really grateful that you are able to do this. But first, I what I usually do is I ask the speaker to kind of introduce themselves, maybe talk about why they got involved in Chiari specifically, what, what their interest is in that or related disorders, anything like that. And then you can go through your presentation. Uh, I'm going to disappear while you're doing your presentation. And then as we do after your presentation, we'll do some Q&A. But I always like to start with a little bit of a introduction. So whenever you're ready, you can go right ahead. Okay, so uh, my name is Rabia Kessler and uh, I'm currently a pediatric a neurosurgeon at McCrane Children's Hospital in De Los Cotton White in Temple, Texas. And in fact, uh, starting August 1st, hopefully I will be starting at uh, Riley Children's Hospital at Indiana University. And uh, um, my uh, Training, as you can imagine, is in uh, pediatric neurosurgery. Of course, before that, in general neurosurgery, when you train, you um, go through the entire gamut of uh, uh, surgical cases. So in those cases, you you do take, get to take care of um, adult patients as well. Uh, my uh, current practice uh, right now is um, all pediatrics and uh, starting, I guess, uh, in July, August uh, in Indiana. It's also going to be in pediatrics because it's uh, based in, in the uh, pediatric hospital. The reason um, I uh, got involved in carry malformation and uh, treating this disease is because of the just the nature of my specialty. Uh, we do uh, get uh, pediatric patients who have Chiari malformations, which are discovered through several um, uh, ports. So they most of the time reach me after they have seen neurology and neurology uh, has uh, worked them up and or they're being worked up for migraines or sometimes it's just a matter of uh, having a concussion head injury um, and then discovering that you, you have this. So um, that's how I kind of uh, got involved in it. Uh, more recently, I was also involved in, um, you know, the guidelines uh, formation for uh, the Chiari malformation. And it has been an amazing experience uh, having to go through the literature. I think collectively, we have gone through thousands of, uh, of papers uh, on this and uh, basically um, have are hoping to get something out uh, uh, fairly within the next year, within this year. So um, that that's uh, how I kind of uh, got started. Now the topic initially I was uh, going to address was uh, the workup and um, how to parse out different types of uh, MRIs, what investigation to do. Etc. for Chiari malformation, um, and how do you arrive at um, your um, conclusion as to what the next steps are going to be after the management? But then um, uh, Mary uh, was uh, kind enough to point out that I think we are covering that already, um, and then maybe we can do the surgical management part of it, which is really interesting. Um, I um, basically have uh, this approach to surgical management from a more of a pediatric perspective, of course, than uh, the adult perspective. So I think that um, uh, please take that into account that most of my patients are uh, 18 years or less. Um, but uh, as a resident and uh, occasionally during my fellowships, I have treated patients who are older than that as well. So um, just before we get started, um, Let's, uh, I wanted to just briefly go over some of the uh, definitions of various types of carry malformations. 
So um, in, in a broad category, we can divide them into six type. Um, the one which I'm going to be dealing with today mostly is going to be Chiari 1 malformation. Uh, this also happens to be the most common uh, malformation. Um, they're all, one thing I would like to point out is that even though we've got six uh, malformations which are considered uh, in the Chiari category, there is, uh, if you look into it, no, uh, common pathophysiological basis of all of these, they're all different. Um, neither are they related to, um, related to a single pathophysiology or manifestation. Um, I think um, the broad category is because of the fact that they all uh, affect the craniocervical junction. So the base of our skull and uh, relationship of cert, uh, the neurological, uh, of the certain nervous tissue um, in relation to the uh, to our uh, skull base. So Chiari 1 malformation, uh, most likely everybody is familiar with uh, what cerebellar tonsils are. This is the lowest, most, most hanging part of the cerebellar hemispheres. We've got two of those. And uh, this descent of that below the foramen magnum, and I'll show it to you in, uh, in one of the photographs which is coming up um, next. Um, if the descent is anywhere from three to seven millimeters, it's considered uh, abnormal. Up to three millimeters is considered cerebellar ectopia. Uh, some papers say it's five millimeters, some say it's seven, so I've actually included the whole gamut of those. Then coming to Chiari 2 malformations. Chiari 2 malformations are mostly, nearly always associated with uh, myelomeningocele. Uh, and uh, that's a descent of medulla cervical junction. So that's the brainstem is actually descended along with the cerebellar tonsils and the part of the cerebellar vermis, which is connecting the two hemispheres, um, as well as sometimes even part of the fourth ventricle. So you can imagine this is a very uh, uh, extensive uh, pathology. Then Chiari 3 malformation is the rarest, and thankfully it is the rarest because it's also considered with the most pathology uh, and sometimes can actually be even incompatible uh, with life, unfortunately. This is what we call an encephalosia, where it's not the already formed uh, foramen magnum through which the normal foramen which, through which it's in, uh, exiting, but it's actually an abnormal defect in the skull base, uh, or the normal skull bone, um, through which cerebellum and sometimes even the brainstem is her herniating. And that you can imagine if it involves a brainstem that could be compatible, but not compatible with life because of uh, compression of the brainstem and that being our seat for um, respiratory and uh, um, the cardiac system, it can actually uh, affect that. Then Chiari uh, 4 malformation is um, uh, considered just the hypoplasia or aplasia. So that is either a smaller cerebellum than normal or just the absence of it. And this can be taken in the category of cysts in the posterior fossa as well. Uh, then Chiari 0 malformation, where you see only the syrinx without tonsillar herniation. So if you have worked up everything and the patient just has a syrinx and however has symptoms of uh, Chiari uh, malformation 1, then it would be considered Chiari 0. Then Chiari 1.5 uh, malformation is uh, when you have tonsillar herniation with some of, again, the brainstem also herniating down, but this is not associated with the Chiari 2 or myelomeningocele. So that's the overall definition of uh, some basic definitions of Chiari malformations. Now, uh, just a brief, uh, um, a, a brief workup because I think we cannot decide about what to do if you've not done the workup. So I'm uh, going to uh, leave um, the workup part, the the more detailed workup part to um, I think it's Doctor, is it uh, Papa who's doing this? I think right, Mary. But uh, I think he's going to be touching up on that. Uh, but any time you have to work up for a Chiari malformation, uh, you have uh, generally the gold standard is doing an MRI. Um, that can be uh, based on uh, looking at that. That's done to look at the anatomy of the posterior fossa, which is the back part of our, the lower part of our skull. 
cup where the cerebellum and the brainstem reside. Uh, also looking at any other causes of tonsillar herniation, which could be a hydrocephalus, which is water buildup in the brain or uh, tumors or some other pathology. Then also it helps us uh, looking to look at uh, the cervical spine anatomy um, to see if there's any syrinx and then uh, lower down a uh, tethered cord. So for example, in this, I can you guys see my... Uh, yes. No, but can you see my pointer? Yes, the, the little arrow moving around. Yeah. Arrow, yes, okay, fine, great. So uh, basically, as we were talking about some of the definitions, so this is what we would consider the posterior fossa. You can see the cerebellum resides in it as well as the brainstem. In this particular one, when we're talking about any time we're talking about cerebellar um, herniation, tonsillar herniation below a certain level, we best basically measure it from the skull base and the foramen basically is from this bony part to this bony part and whatever is herniating below that is considered tonsillar herniation and this is the, uh, the tonsillar herniation. Then this is the brainstem. The other part I was trying to uh, uh, tell you about was the cervical spine anatomy. So if you look at this, this is the part of the second vertebrae and you can see how it's kind of digging back into the brainstem. So that is also another thing which you would have to consider a few things about how to proceed and which procedures to do in this particular case or what to look for if you go for the basic um, decompression. So that's um, the tonsillar herniation. Then when we talk about the Chiari 2 malformation, as you can see, the brainstem is, we have a very small posterior fossa. So in that one, if I go back, see you've got plenty of space here your uh, the top uh, the top part or roof of the posterior fossa is around here. However, in the second one, you can see that the roof is so low that this is the only part which is remaining. And this one, like I said, you don't not only have the cerebellar tonsil, which is herniating, but part of the brainstem, which should have been approximately here, is also kind of going down. This could this is part of the a fourth ventricle, which is also going down. And that's all because of a very small posterior fossa. Then, uh, like I said, looking for a syrinx, as you can see in this one, as you can see, this, this, uh, the dense is actually pretty good. However, you can see that the, sorry, the tonsillar herniation goes up until the front of um, the, uh, the posterior part of our cervical spine. And then um, this is the syrinx. Uh, this is all supposed to be solid, and you can see this uh, the canal being expanded there. Then the other thing, like I said, we look for is a tethered cord. So if you have a cord which is supposed to end, if this is the sacrum, and if this is the five, four, three, two, one uh, lumbar vertebrae, usually we, you would have the spine ending up here rather than down here, and you can see that it's actually going way down, way below than it's supposed to be. And what this is indicating, you can see this, uh, the difference between these two scans is that one has uh, fat shortening. So you can see that this is fat, which is kind of going in into the defect here. And that's what's tethering the cord there. Uh, another uh, part of the workup is ophthalmology exam to see whether or not there is pressure buildup in the head or not. Um, and that's looking for pre, uh, papilledema, if there are any cranial nerve abnormalities, for example, if there is any uh, problems with eye movements, for example. Uh, so you can see the disc here is very sharp uh, in a normal scan, which is this right here. And you can barely make out the margin. So that's papilledema or swelling of the uh, nerves. Then the next one is cervical spine x-rays to look at instability. Um, and uh, generally what we're looking for is the margin right back here because our spinal cord lives in this region right here. And if you can imagine there is a movement of either of the spine back and forth between these two, then that would indicate that it could actually be causing compression of either the brainstem or the tonsils and causing problems. Then um, I also sometimes like to do sleep study because I always ask the question whether or not the patients have um, 
any uh, snoring, any problems with swallowing, and this kind of helps me determine whether the brainstem is being compressed or not. And what we're trying to determine is whether the patient has obstructive sleep apnea or central sleep apnea. Now, obstructive sleep apnea, as you can imagine, because I, again, deal with kids, so they can have a lot of uh, tonsillar hypertrophy problems with nasal polyps, et cetera, deviated nasal septums, any of those things can cause uh, snoring and, and sleep apnea but that's uh, the obstructive cause. Now, the central sleep apnea can generally be, would be caused by compression of the brainstem and that can result in uh, uh, problems with breathing uh, during night and then daytime uh, sleepiness. So now coming to the decision-making with, uh, with Chiari uh, malformation, how do we make a decision about when to decompress or not decompress and what kind of surgery to do? and what um, kind of uh, additional uh, things that we need to do in order to uh, address these. Now, if you look at it, um, of course, like we said, we start off with the Chiari malformation and see if they have radiographically confirmed Chiari 1 malformation. Now, the reason you have to divide it between asymptomatic versus symptomatic is because sometimes we discover Chiari malformations because of uh, MRI being a part of workup or something else. I, for example, see a lot of kids who have had a concussion, have had injuries, head injuries, uh, sports injuries. They may have had a motor vehicle accident or sometimes just uh, being worked up for migraines or seizures. And um, the, the um, imaging gets done and a Chiari gets discovered. Uh, now, that's where a very important part of all of this, in addition to the imaging, is uh, history taking. So um, I would go into detail of whether or not some of the symptoms I have to sometimes parse out, whether the symptoms are post-concussive symptoms, whether these are migraines, or uh, these are headaches related to uh, the Chiari 1 malformation itself. Uh, also, like I uh, said, we will uh, we would look at whether or not they have any issues with swallowing, any problems with uh, sleep apnea, um, any issues with cervical instability and or uh, syrinx related symptoms. So, if they if this this was completely discovered um, um, incidentally, which would be asymptomatic, then you also look at whether or not the patient has a syrinx or no syrinx. If they have a syrinx, generally, again, it's not an automatic cranial decompression. If generally, sometimes, if you have more than seven millimeter of descent, then um, uh, chiari, cranial, sorry, with asymptomatic chiari, mind you, then decompression may be indicated or you can still observe it. If there's no syrinx, you can still continue to observe it. Then if you have symptomatic uh, Chiari malformation, then you're looking at headaches and let's say if their headaches are being caused by tumor or hydrocephalus, then you would actually want to address that first before going for a Chiari malformation and determining whether it's actually idiopathic Chiari malformation or there's a reason for it. If there's a reason for it, for example, tumor, hydrocephalus, uh, pseudo tumor, then you would address that rather than do a decompression because that may actually worsen the problem. And a one, the other thing which is not mentioned here is I also like to address whether or not the patient has a tethered cord. So if the patient has a tethered cord, I would first go and detether the cord, then look at the Chiari malformation, and then um, uh, observe it for a, a few months and then see if that gets better or not. Um, and then decide what the next step is going to be. If they don't have any hydrocephalus, uh, then I think going to a craniocervical decompression is reasonable. Um, then if they have, um, let's say, you know, the other imaging that I brought up was if you have compression from the front or uh, if you have instability, spine instability, then you have to actually decide about whether or not you do something about that. In that case, you may actually have to go uh, transoral or approach through the mouth and uh, then uh, do that before and or with decompression. Let's say you do the cervical decompression. However, the syrinx is still persist. If uh, it persists, you can consider either another decompression if the posterior fossa is still looking tight 
and or insertion of the syringo subarachnoid joint. Then if you do the compression, but there's a still continued symptoms of pain or uh, dysthesia, however, the syrinx has gone away, then you may actually observe it for a while because sometimes the Chiari, uh, uh, the symptoms may persist after, uh, despite of uh, uh, doing the decompression for a bit. Then uh, generally the approach is to try to take the bone off. Now you try actually some, the, the measurement that I have stuck to and have actually found it to be really uh, useful and my patients have had really good outcomes is I most of the time do take out the uh, back part of the first uh, cervical vertebrae. I would do a decompression, which is basically just two and a half centimeters above and three centimeters across. The reason for doing this is because all you're trying to do is make this uh, region larger. Then I actually go for uh, the duroplasty. So I open the dura. I actually look at the cerebellar tonsils. If they're enlarged still and there's a still no breathing room, I would actually constrict them and shrink them. And, um, and then once I can see clear flow, I can see the fourth ventricle and the opening of the fourth ventricle and obex, that's when I actually stop. I then like to do a, a duroplasty, which is uh, sewing in a piece of dura to this, which again gives even more uh, uh, room for the posterior fossa in that region, and then uh, close it up. Now, um, this, uh, the, as you probably, some of you guys may be, um, uh, may be familiar with, there are several approaches to how you uh, go around doing this. Some people do only posterior fossa decompression, which is just the bony decompression. Um, and um, then the other one is posterior fossa decompression with duroplasty is what I actually explained. Now, uh, both, the um, procedures people who go for uh, who choose to do one or the other have actually had really um, good results uh, from uh, when they have looked at it. Uh, the reoperation rate generally with um, uh, posterior fossa decompression is around 2.1% uh, with duroplasty can be 12.6%. Now this could be because it's it's may be worse and then they have needed more. CSF leak, of course, uh, with, I think I may have written this uh, incorrectly, I'm sorry, because I think this is, but the decompression is 2.1, the other one's 12.1, 18.5 is with the duroplasty because there's more CSF leak and 1.8 over here, sorry. Uh, there was no statistical difference between these. However, the clinical improvement occurred in 65% of the patient with just the bony decompression and with the duroplasty was 79%. Syrinx resolved in 56% of these uh, patients and then 87% in these. The reason I added this little part here is because uh, when uh, an international survey was done for pediatric neurosurgeons, you can see majority of us actually choose to do the uh, decompression with the duroplasty, which is what I, I generally go for as well. Now, the second question is whether or not, because I'd seen some questions pop up, which are about uh, you know whether to fuse or not. That's generally determined by two factors. One is whether the spine is unstable or not. And um, if uh, we do the x-rays and see that there is instability, if you remove the bone, you can imagine that there will be more mobility. And in those cases, generally, you would want to do it up front. Sometimes if you see the dents, which is a little bit further back, you have to watch those patients really, really closely. Because if... Um, you take the bone off, there's a possibility that the dents may go further back and actually cause uh, a more compression of that brain stem. So uh, coming to these questions, are the people who submitted these questions here? I thought I would just try to address them at the same time. I mean, yeah. this was kind of my, I was given around 20 minutes. So I've tried to finish this between 20 to 25 <laughs> minutes. I think I kind of made it on, on time. No, um, you did so I had to. We, so there are some people that did ask these questions that are on. So if you want to go through these, that's great. Absolutely. Okay. So yes, I, I tried to stay within the time timeline. <laughs> <You're> great. <laughs> 
Awesome. So uh, the first question was about uh, some uh, this patient. Um, this person had a foot drop several years ago, uh, had swallowing difficulties, and actually the EGD um, and some nerve, nerve conduction study did show that there was problems with swallowing. The patient also, unfortunately, has uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Uh, and then uh, has cranial instability, arterial venous malformation. So neurologist is saying no surgery. The neurosurgeon is saying surgery. So I think one of the things you wanted me to clarify was whether the neurosurgeons and neurologists often disagree. Um, you know, to be honest, I don't think I've ever had any problems <laughs> with this because most of the time, uh, you know, we always have a discussion um, I always explain really well to my patients why I'm choosing to do something or not doing something. And then same with the neurologist. When I talk to my colleagues, I'm actually making them part of the discussion along with the patient so that we are all on the same page about what's the goal of surgery, what do I think may or may not improve, and then we can make an informed decision based on that based on that. So how is the decision uh, to have surgery made? Like I said, you know, um, for me, clinical, it's not just clinical and it's not just based on the picture. It's a combination of both that has to be there. And even then, I am I generally like to discuss with my patients, what are the things I actually think will improve or won't improve after the surgery so that we go in with a uh, a uh, very clear delineation and uh, markers of what what to expect after the surgery. One of the ways that I had kind of simplified this question, I, I just am personally interested in it. Under what circumstances would a surgeon be unable to finish or complete a surgery? Is is there? I mean, you talk about that bleeding, but is there anything else that maybe for some reason you go in there and um, you realize, you know, this is not the right thing to do? Like, does that ever happen or? So I think, um, again, generally, you know, like I said, I think um, I have only done bony decompression on, only bony decompression on two patients. One was seven week old. And uh, the other one was also a baby. I think she was two or three months old. And the whole reason was because of, again, the same thing that, you know, I did not want to make the spine unstable. I did not want to make, a, you know, open that dura because bottom line is if I just, and it was actually the bone at which I could see was literally digging into it. And they both had what we call central sleep apnea and mm -hmm. post-operatively it actually did improve. So those were like, you know, I think it was good. I've told them that, you know, we'll be watching it at, some point when they're grown up and they're still having symptoms and stuff, then we can go in and open it. But I think at that point, they'll be bigger. You can imagine in a seven week old, you know, if you open, you can just kind of, you know, yeah. lose a lot of blood. So I think bleeding is one of those uh, one of those reasons why you would not do it. Or let's say you go in and you find something else like a tumor or something like that, which I very highly doubt because again, I don't think how would it not be discovered on the MRI? Right. So generally, again, like, you know, if I'm going in, I have studied the scan, you know, really well. So I know exactly what to expect and kind of what to do. And that's yeah. what I've discussed with my patients too, that this is what I'm going to do. If this happens, we'll do this. If this happens, we'll do this. And like, you know, so that we're all kind of on the same page. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. So then let's see if there was any other question. So how do you know if you have a CSF leak or a blockage? I think you had combined this one and the last question together, right? Yes. So the last question, just to repeat it, it says, I have KRE1 syringomyelia operation in mm -hmm. 2007, but they're having issues mm -hmm. again. When I lay down for a long time, my ear is wet. Um, mm -hmm. Is this something to get checked out or should I not worry about it? And so to me, it kind of sounded similar, but I, so I kind of combine them, but if they are separate, please, please. Okay. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, one of the things which uh, is about how do you know if you have a CSF leak or a blockage? So it's the kind of headache you will have. So generally kind of, you know, what we call spinal headaches versus hydrocephalus type of headaches, which are due to pressure buildup. 
So most of the time when you have a pressure buildup, you will actually get headaches when you're lying down because the fluid is just kind of, you know, building up and you can imagine um, our spinal fluid column as a column. And once it's flat, so when you're up, it kind of drains down and then you will have less pressure. So most of the people who have hydrocephalus or have pressure buildup, they generally wake up with headaches in the morning because they've been lying flat, that fluid has been kind of building up and you wake up, you have a headache first thing in the morning. Now, as far as the CSF leak is concerned, patients who have CSF leak may actually just have obvious CSF leak from the ear, from the nose, something like that. Or they, if this is a spinal leak, for example, some patients who have, uh, for example, epidurals can you know, uh, experience that. Or, or people who have pseudomeningocils can experience that. Um, and in those cases, A, you would actually see the swelling in those places maybe. If it's not that, then what will happen is that they won't wake up with the headache, they'll actually be feeling great. But as they get up and the spinal fluid starts leaking down, that's when they start having the headache. So lying down when you have pressure buildup or blockage. Up is when the CSF is leaking out. You can imagine if there's a hole in a bucket and it's leaking out, then you know, you'll get the headache because of that. Um, and then as far as how it gets diagnosed, um, obviously that's the clinical reason that they would go into the doctor, but um, how, how does the doctor kind of diagnose it when they get into the, the room with you? Okay, so blockage is, of course, hydrocephalus. Like I said, papilledema, you would look for maybe ICP monitor, EVD, or you see the ventricles and they look like that, right? So that's pretty um, straightforward in that sense. As far as the CSF leak is concerned, generally, if you actually have some fluid draining either from the ear or the nose, uh, then in those cases, you will send it for something called beta-2 transferrin, which is a uh, element only present in spinal fluid. So if it's positive for them, then that gives you an answer. Most of this time, Chiari malformation won't give you what we call autoria, so spinal fluid leak through the ear or through the nose, because we generally are not you know, unless and until there has been a drum rupture from something else, you won't see it. So most of the time, let's say, you know, when we see it coming from the ear, it's after a trauma. So people who have had trauma or something like that, or if let's say there's another issue going on at the skull base over there, then you can get the spinal fluid leak. But generally from a Chiari malformation, let's say if you, you won't see a spinal fluid, I've never seen it. I don't, so that doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's never happened, but I don't know of any. Um, and then second thing is, you know, we don't go anywhere near the ear. You're essentially working in the midline. You don't see the ear canal. You don't even go that far. Like I said, like, you know, generally you stay in the midline. So you won't get it from, the, from, from that per se. So it's either some actual ear related problem, could be an encephalo seal as well which is sometimes where the, there's a defect in the bone and that things can kind of you know protrude down that could be a problem but again that you would see on the mri other thing is if you do it with contrast and if you have csf leak you can get something called cranial hypotension so lower pressure and that can light up all the dura the other third thing you can do is literally you can do a dye test so that would be you do a lumbar puncture you inject the dye or the uh, you know nucleotide or something, and then kind of either take pictures and then see if it's actually turning green, for example, that's the dye generally that's used. So either from the nose or the ear. Um, as far as the spine is concerned, if there's a leak somewhere, if it's you know in the front or the back, then you can have issues. And again, a CSF leak, what was that? Can lead to? Can, can a CSF leak lead to balance problems? There's a, a lack of balance or coordination, depth perception, as well as hearing loss. Um, had an MDEC, which I'm not sure what that is, to be honest with you, uh, which what is, is how, that? yeah, we might need to. <laughs> it, it, um, MDEC, is MDEC, it's, a, um, it's like a test that they do. Like it's what? From um, multiple doctors get together like a meeting and then they like the um neurologist and um the, the neurosurgeon get together and decide 
Is it kind of like a conference or something? It is. Um, it's, it's a evaluation. So I think like, you know, to be honest, Gabriel, your symptoms are sounding a little bit more like middle ear symptoms. So that wetness could actually be, I don't know, they may have to look into, do you have any middle ear or inner ear problems? Because those can lead to imbalance. Chiari in itself okay. can lead to imbalance if you got, you know, let's say D, you know, syrinx or something of that sort. Um, yes, it can lead to it, but if you're having middle, like, you know, ear um, uh, leakage, then I would actually have an ENT kind of look into that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think the next question is maybe the last one. Um, I think there yeah. were two more. Yes, so this one is convincing the neurologist that your headache is not a migraine, but a Chiari. How do clinicians tell the difference between migraines and a Chiari headache? So generally, you know, uh, there have been studies and I think, you know, we reviewed a ton of papers about this recently about what kind of headaches improve or do not improve for, from a Chiari decompression. So most of the time when I have a conversation with uh, my patients, I like I you know just like I told you guys before that we parse out exactly what kind of headaches do you get. A lot of times patients can't tell me themselves what are migraine headaches versus you know uh, Chiari related headaches. Most of the time, Chiari related headaches, which I which most of us considered very typical, and that's been kind of you know looked at in studies again and again is the ones which are called tussive headaches, which is tussive, if you know from Robitussin and stuff like that, that means coughing, right? So anything which increases the pressure inside your belly, inside your chest, and then get transferred to the head or pressure inside the head, that is resultant in a headache. So if you cough, if you are you know, constipated and you're trying to poop and uh, that causes headaches at times, um, you know, I literally had a five-year-old girl who was severely constipated. She wouldn't go to the bathroom for five days. Poor baby. Aww. And they kept treating her from that point of view. And she was super quiet, like you know, one of five kids so, and kind of in the middle. So she was just basically a quiet little cutie. And, um, you know, mom comes in and she's not talking. And, you know, mom's like, yeah, by the way, she also has constipation as well. And I'm like, what, you've got constipation, why? Because I am obsessive about trying to decrease that before I do the surgery because they can, those are the kids who end up with pseudomeningocele, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I asked her and I was like, wait, why? She was like, oh, I don't like pooping. And I'm like, really? Like, you know, what does that mean? And I actually just then outright asked her a direct question. And I was like, does your head hurt when this happens? And she, she goes like, yes. And she, oh. the poor baby, had not even told her mom because she thought that was normal, you know? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it's supposed to be. And oh, she didn't God. have any other symptoms. So, oh, wow. you know, like we did the surgery and lo and behold, you know, well, of course she did have some constipation initially. She did come up with the pseudomeningocele and we find so much of poop in there. We had to completely do our clean up. And then after that, she did well. And then, you know, she, her constipation cleared up everything. So, I mean, it's just literally anything which builds up pressure, jumping, you know, kids stopped going on trampoline because it's hurt so much. Yep. So those are the kind of headaches which I associate with that. Um, there, I think there was recently actually a couple of papers that I read, which actually said, and most of the headaches, which happen more kind of holocephalic, which are all over the head, um, even if they improved initially, they return back. And that's what I try to tell my patients that, you know, the one headache I can guarantee you, which will hopefully get better, is basically the one which is, you know, related to pressure buildup. It's not like, you know, if this is, if this gets better, great, but that's not what I'm doing the surgery for. So if it comes back, we need to figure out what's causing that headache. And the migraine headaches, like, you know, again, a neurologist will most likely be able to, you know, tell you much better about those. And again, thankfully, we've got really amazing neurologists who can parse that out. Um, we actually had a lot of success with, uh, at least with the kids, 
doing magnesium sulfates and uh, vitamin B6, and they actually improved really well without even medications. And then also, it the other trigger in kids at least is you know dehydration and not drinking because they go in the morning so they have their food breakfast way before you know some of these poor kids leave at like 6 a.m and stuff so and their lunch break or like you know the minimum the snacks don't happen till 11 so they have not eaten for that long and so then that's when they start having headaches and that's generally a trigger for migraine yeah and we improved some of those things and they actually do get better without even medications that's amazing yeah Mm -hmm. that poor girl who couldn't poop is just like it's (laughs) that's deeply upsetting to me (laughs) she she didn't even know right because for her that was normal she thought that was just normal (laughs) yeah oh my gosh Um, yeah i think there was one more pre-sent question and then i we actually did get a question on Instagram, actually, um, that I do want to like toss in if we have time, uh, really quick. Or sure, let's see, what's the next one? Do I have the next one? No, okay, yeah. so this yeah. one was, I think this is the last one, right? Because then the last yeah. one we had. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, this one was mom well, with kids, both have, we assumed it was carrying malformation, right? And then 14 millimeter herniated cerebellum and syringomyelia, syringobulbia, scoliosis, EDS, postural uh, orthostatic syndrome. Had first decompression 2014, now getting worse. Uh, what type of KRE case would require another surgery? Would multiple versus incorporate the resume for the, yeah. Okay. So it depends on <clears throat> what are the symptoms which are returning. And what was, when they did the first decompression, what did they do? Did they only do the bony decompression? Did they do the whole you know, opening up the dura, doing the duroplasty, opening the posterior, you know, uh, fossa. Did we do all of that? Or, you know, uh, so that that would determine it. I would, of course, always want to get another MRI after that just to see what is the posterior fossa looking like right now. Because frankly, if everything looks open, then there's no use doing another surgery because you cannot, you know, improve on that. Um, however, if there is a scarring or if there is something else, then we would have to see the other thing. You know, if you're having syringomyelia, syringobulbia, et cetera, I would also be looking at, you know, what is the dense looking like? Is this, you know, now a retrograde where you may have opened the posterior fossa and everything, but now is this going back and causing pressure? Because in that case, you may actually have to think about a fusion rather than a Chiari decompression. Uh, and if she has hydrocephalus, then the first thing I always, does she have hydrocephalus? No, she doesn't. But yeah, but that would be the other thing I would always check for. Right. Okay. Um, then really quickly, there was a question that came in on Instagram and I would like to add it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and you know what, it's, it's a good one because we get this one a lot and I feel like everyone kind of has a different answer. Um, mm-hmm. So this patient, I don't know if it's an adult or a child, um, but they've had two decompressions and the syrinx hasn't decreased in size. So okay. what would you do in the case of maybe the syrinx hasn't changed and they're symptomatic versus they're asymptomatic? Is there a difference in what you would do there? I am so glad you asked because I think we actually had a thing, remember? So this one. So this was the algorithm, I think, in one of the more recent papers, where basically, let's say you do the Chiari decompression. Oh, why is this doing this? Where is my... I want to go back to the pointer. Hmm. Let's see. Um, mm, laser pointer. Yeah. There yeah, you. yeah, there you go. It's odd, but like it's there. So, so <laughs> yeah, it works. So basically, you look at this, you know, in this algorithm, it, the patient was symptomatic. There was no hydrocephalus, so you know you don't do the shunt. Then you do the cranial cervical decompression. Now, if you know this is the one where you have the resolution of syrinx, so that's like gone. We're we're good with that. However, if there's failure, <clears throat> sorry. If there's failure of primary, proce- uh, of primary procedure with persistent symptomatic syrinx, 
then you may actually consider a craniocervical decompression versus insertion of a syringo subarachnoid stent, which is essentially putting a catheter between that syrinx and the spinal cord. So I would, uh, you know, as far as that is concerned, if it's symptomatic um, uh, syrinx, I think there's actually a measurement. Oh, I'm just blanking on it. But there's actually a paper, really good one, in which they measure the syrinx and if it's, uh, asymptomatic, then you don't treat it because sometimes it can take up to a year or even longer for it to go away. Uh, or if it even doesn't and there is asymptomatic, then you're just going to observe it closely, right? If it's symptomatic, then in that case, you may observe it for three months, maybe six months. At six months, if it's still persistent and you have symptoms, then you may have to, again, also, not just look at the syrinx, you would have to look at the craniocervical junction itself to see if you have a retroflex odontoid or if there's any instability of the cervical spine. Maybe because, you know, on the scan, it may look fine because that's a, that's a picture in one instance, right? You're not mo doing that mobile thing. You, although, you know, I have actually done some dynamic MRIs and they have shown that there was a, you know, problem. Uh, but not every institution does that. I think we used to have it in Minnesota, but that's the only place I've had it done. Um, I've, they, you know, we, we had done it on a, on a patient to kind of figure out what the instability was because you could see the dis, um, you could see the signal changes on the spinal cord, but you know, if you look at the MRI initially, you would not see a problem. And you're like, you know, what? Why is this problem there? And then when you did the, we did the dynamic study, we could see that, you know, it was kind of hitting the cord. Yeah. So in the, those cases, like I said, if it's asymptomatic, I would just watch it, and then see in the next year or two how does it get better or not. And frankly, if it's not very large, if it's kind of medium size, then you will just kind of have that done. Uh, okay. Question. And um, then uh, yeah, if it's, you know, symptomatic, then like I said, you know, I would still give them maybe three more months to see if it gets better or it settles down. Three to six months, if it doesn't get better, then we can talk about either decompression again, depending on what the posterior fossa looks like or fusion and or a stent. Okay, perfect, thank you. And then I don't know if you wanna just touch on this question really quickly. Um, they did have a, an evaluation two years ago for a cochlear implant with an ENT, who's also a skull-based surgeon. Uh, is a second opinion probably important for? The generally, autoneurologists, I think they're called. They're pretty darn good. And again, like I was fortunate enough to train at University of Minnesota, where we had an amazing guy, um, Dr. Levine. <laughs> he was... Then you know, I think they actually have a fellowship for a neurotology. And, you know, Dr. Haynes and him worked like hand in hand. So we did a lot of skull based cases together. And we did, you know, uh, I saw a fair amount of pathology with both of them. So, you know, if you've got a good one, I, I would say, you know, they, they would tell you, well, yeah. They would guide you well. And, I, and again, like, you know, I personally never stop my patients from having a second opinion because going in, I want them to trust me and me to trust them so that we have a mutual, you know, understanding. So I, I never, ever discourage my patients from getting a second opinion. <laughs> well, those are good. <laughs> yeah. um, so I want to thank you so much. Dr. Kasser, for being here with us today. Um, I try to end all of this with how people can get in touch with you. And I know you just said actually that you're gonna be moving a little, in a little bit. So um, mm -hmm. how can um, parents of patients who maybe need some help get in touch with mm -hmm. you? Um, and you know, how can anyone find you? <laughs> so um, I think, uh, you know, once I get to Riley, I can email you guys my new email address. And that's how you can I can find find you or whenever I get my card over there, maybe I can scan email it to you. Will that be okay? That would be perfect. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And uh, Riley, just one more time, is it's in at Indiana Indiana University? Indianapolis uh, with Indiana University. Yep. Perfect. All right. 
Thank you, Dr. Kesser, for being here with us today and everyone for joining and having like a really robust discussion. It was kind of great. Um, uh, and I, that's all. So thanks, everyone. Awesome. If anybody has any other questions, they, you guys can feel free to email me. I'd be happy to answer. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.